Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Saturday live stream. So we got a lot of things to cover. So let's just jump right into it, shall we? So the, this whole video, it sprung about because when we're doing the NFA live show on Thursday over on Guy's channel, he has a, pr a pretty important question. And it was like the question number three he said, hey, what are you guys into as far as like with stocks, as far as crypto stocks? And uh, Ben talked about how, you know, Coinbase and Marathon and a couple other different uh, Bitcoin mining operations were a pretty good bet for him. And I talked about MicroStrategy, but it really, it got me to thinking about this because I really don't dive too much into stocks. I'm just not that person, more, more so real estate and, and, uh, and uh, crypto and digital assets. So I thought to myself, maybe I should just, maybe I'm missing something. So I put this little, this little presentation together. And we're going to take a look at stocks versus Bitcoin. And if we're going to talk about stocks and Bitcoin, because at some point we're going to sell, we're going to take some profits. So we need to talk about taxes. And it's one of those things that I pretty much skim over. And I really shouldn't because it's important to everybody because they have to actually factor that in. So let's just take a look at my answer, which was, I said, well, MicroStrategy has done pretty well. You know, let's see how it's actually done. And we can take a look at MicroStrategy, which I think Michael Saylor's company is essentially a proxy for Bitcoin. It's done quite well. Not so much over the past six months. And we can see here that over the past five days, it's been down 15%. Over the past month, it's been down uh, roughly 8.33, almost 9%. Uh, over six months, it's been down 12%. But, and again, this actually kind of lines up equities and crypto and digital assets, actually any kind of investing that you do as far as assets go, it's a broad time horizon. And you can see here that over a year, uh, MicroStrategy is up 223%. And if we go over five years, we can see that it's up massively 717%. So it got me to thinking, I'm like, maybe I'm missing out on some massive gains as far as like with stocks. Now, if we're talking about individual stocks, I can see it, especially if we take a look at like NVIDIA, but I got to tell you, I think most of the people that are out there have not been investing in NVIDIA for seven plus years. I think it's just a big hype train right now because of AI and just how fast it's actually gone. I think most of the gains are made over a, like I say, like a longer time horizon. So you have to ask the question then, well, if we're not going to talk about individual stocks, so they, they can do pretty well, but you know, some are quite volatile and really about, it is about what you get into. What about indices? What about the S&P 500? You know, if that would be like an easy solution, right? So if we take a look at it, S&P 500, I think people know most about the statistic, but uh, as far as like the gain that you've had, you gain about 10.7% annually since the introduction of it in 1957. Now, different years will do better. Like in 2023, you were actually up 24%. That's pretty good. Uh, returns may fluctuate widely year to year, but if we take it over an average, you're looking at about 10.2, 10.7. So let's just say 10%. That's your average return. And then I thought to myself, well, I mean, shoot, we just saw uh, almost 2 trillion, 1.78 trillion was wiped out from the US stock market just last week. And as we all talk about on this channel, it's kind of important that we get into things when they're low as opposed to when they're popping off. So maybe this would be the time to get into like something very safe, like an S&P 500. Let's take a look. So I thought, well, everybody's different, right? Some people are billionaires. Some people are millionaires. Some people are hundred heirs and they really don't have too much. So I want to take a look at what, what can people afford? And I took a look at the national average salary in the U.S. in Q4 was almost 60,000. This is, this is according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Take that for what it's worth. And of course, different states are different. Here in the United States, if you're in Mississippi, you only make around 48,000 on average. If you're in the, the nice state of Massachusetts, which John Deaton is hopefully gonna beat Elizabeth Warren for the Senate spot, uh, you're looking at 86,000. And of course, different people make different money, obviously, right? Highest earners in the US were cardiologists, 421,000. And then the least earners, I didn't know this was a job, shampooers at 27,870. If you're a shampooer, sorry, I didn't know that was a thing, but it's it just fluctuates across the board. So I thought, okay, I ran some numbers and there's a link in the description. Actually, there's a link in the description for this presentation. And you can find all the links on this presentation itself. It's open to the public you can check it out. And there's investment detail calculator. And I thought to myself, well, what can people afford? And then I and I wanted to just see like, if, you know, how about like a thousand dollar investment? I ran the numbers and it was just abysmal. <laughs> and, I, and you can run your numbers. So I just said, okay, let's take, you know, on average around 70,000, 10% of that 
7,000, whatever. How long would it take you to make a million getting into a very safe return, which is the S&P 500? You know, it would take you 29 years. And that's the estimated rate of return of 10%, 10% compounded annually, which I got to tell you, I mean, that's not too bad. 29 years, you're a millionaire, I suppose. And then I thought to myself, well, how does that compare to say like Bitcoin? And I'm not going to compare like Pepe coin and meme coins because that's ridiculous. It's, I think it's like just people dumping on each other. So let's take a look at Bitcoin, shall we? And what I want to do was I stole this from Ben's website as usual. And you can take a look. What I did was I said, how about if we did a lump sum going back across the years? We're going to take a look at 2016, 17, 18, 19, all the way to 2023 at the very beginning and at the end. So in 2016, obviously you would have made it like a bandit, $7,000 lump sum, boom. Uh, that would have been equal to 16.3 Bitcoin. You would have made a million right there, essentially, 954,058. That's a 13,000% return, not too bad. What about 2017? Well, actually, no, let, let me go back. If I'm looking at this, because what I'm gonna look at is over the next eight years, if I'm going to take a look at, at that as far as the indices, just so you know, before we get into this really deep, if you would have put 7,000 times eight years, going back to 2016, you would have had a total interest of $32,000. You would have put in 63000 which, you know, not too bad. But the what you would have gained would have been 32 your total balance would 95,000 in eight years so just remember that as we go go through this so let's take a look at 2017 how much would you have done if you would have lump sum seven grand you would have made 426,000 that's 5,000 percent return how about 2018 and of course what do we talk about here if we talk about the dips i mean in 2018 january 1st that was almost toward the pico top I mean, we hit, I think we hit the top in December 17th, 2017. So not too, not too far away. So if you would have put 7,000 and just waited this whole time, you'd be up 313%. That'd be a 3X. In 2019, you would have put 7,000, you would have had $108,000. Not too bad. Isn't that weird? Then you take a look at 2018. If you would have put 7,000 in, you would have made less than if you just would have waited a year, which is why, you know, the four year cycles I think are still intact. We have a halving, then a little dip, and then a reset year, then another halving. This is the reset year in 2019. That was the time to buy. I think 2023 was the time to buy as well. Anyhow, 2020, if you'd have put 7,000 in, would have had 56,000. That's a 700% increase. 2021, not too good actually, because that's the all time high years, right? Which is why I think that this is the time right now to do it before we get in 2025. If you would have done 7,000, you would have only doubled your money, which think about that compared to like the S&P 500. 2022, 7,000, you went into well, 22%. You're still out, you're still outshining the S&P. 2023, 24,000 or 252%. Not too bad. So taking a look at all that, how do you feel about the indices and the markets right there? I got to tell you, I know that there's volatility. I think I'll stick to it. But... You have to think about this. What about taxes? So that's a problem. And there's a lot of different theories around how to, you know, to minimize your taxes. There's plenty of different people out there that'll tell you, you know, a bunch of different options for you. But if you take a look at 2016 and 2023, everything we just took a look at and added it all up, that's 1.6 million. The initial investment over eight years, you're going to put 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 every year. That's 56,000. So 56,000 minus 1.6, you're looking at $1.5 million as far as like a net return. Not too bad. Good for you. You know, your diamond hands, good for you. Didn't sell anything. Fantastic. But if you did at some point, especially towards the end here, like I said, with great gains comes great taxes. I don't know where you're at in the world. I don't know what your situation is. I know like in say like Germany, if you hold for over a year, you pay no capital gains tax. Portugal, I think there's no capital gains tax. Uh, pretty sure in El Salvador, no capital gains tax, especially on Bitcoin. 
In America, it's a little bit different and it's a progressive tax. And uh, we've talked about this, but long-term capital gains, you're looking at roughly around 20, 21%. And that is just federal. If you live in these fine states, say like California, uh, you're paying a little more. Or in New York, or in Massachusetts, or in Washington. Thankfully, in Texas and Florida, you don't pay anything, anything more extra per state tax as far as uh, capital gains tax statewide. But outside of that, I'm not going to put that in because there's too many variables. But just be aware that if you're in different states, you're going to pay a little bit more depending on which states you actually live in for capital gains. So if we take a look at that, your net return is 1.5. Let's take capital gains tax at 20%. Even if you did real well, you still got to pay the government 313,000. 313,000 for all your hard work. Congratulations. You're helping the government stay strong as they waste your money on God knows what. So there's that piece. Let's back it up. Let's go back there because some people say, well, Rob, that's not really fair because, you know, you, you did at the very beginning. What if we lump some that say like the end of the year, like December 2016 and then December 2017 at the at the Pico tops, right? All right. So if you do it in 2016, you, you wouldn't have had that 954,000. You would have been up only 7,778 percent and made 551,000. Now, of course, we can't go back. I got you, I got you. But moving forward, it's all about which horse is the fastest. Which one do you think is gonna get you to where you wanna go quicker? And which one is gonna get you to where you wanna go safely? You have to factor all these things in. How about 2017? Well, again, December 1st, 2017, that's pretty much the top, but if you had to put it in there, you'd still be at 40,000 today, 476% increase. How about 2018, December 1st, 2018, 7,000, pretty good, $100,000, 1,000%. Uh, 2019, 674%, 2020, you would be up almost 200%. 2021, eh, you, you didn't do much. I gotta tell you, this is the one where you, the only month that, especially waiting uh, for quite some time, you would only be up 2.24%. So yes, on that one, S&P got me. And then 2022, you're up 244%, 2023, 3,000, or excuse me, 51%. So again, if you take a look at all these things, and let's just add this all up again, here's the uh, gross profit, initial investment, net return. Here's the taxes, state, I'm not gonna add it in because it's too much, too crazy. So you didn't make as much. And good news, you only have to pay the government $150,000. So going through all these things, again, you have to decide which is best for you. Now, I'm leading lead me to my, my last point, and then we'll get into a little Q&A. You can ask me all the questions you want. But I did this post, and I said, if you put $7,000 per year in an IRA account at 30, you'll have $1 million by at the age of 57. Actually, that's not true. It should be 59 years old, because we, we take a look at it, 29 years old, on a 10% rate of return. And I said, if you use iTrust Capital, I think you'd do much better. Because with iTrust, like we talk about, that's a Roth IRA and it's tax exempt. Now, the things that you gain on your income is taxed, but post-tax dollars you put into a Roth IRA, especially with crypto, when you take an allocation out, there is no taxes. And uh, I know people will say, well, you know, you can't really put, you, you can't put a ton in, but if you are like a high earner, good for you, there are these things called backdoor Roth IRAs. And, Take it up with iTrust. Anyhow, there's a link in the description and I've been using them for now three years now and uh, things are doing so well. They've actually gone through a brutal bear market when everybody, everything else was collapsing, these guys are still doing it. However, a couple of things. First of all, some people like Man of Steel here, they actually do trading within their Roth IRA because it's tax exempt. But then there was this email I got today and that's why I'm kind of late on this video because there's a problem with iTrust. And this morning, this is what the email said. He goes, hey, Rob, I got an email from Fortress Trust Resignation, 30-day notice of IRA trustee change about iTrust. And then moving to do a 40 bank. I also got a notice about a one-time fee of $125. 
what's going on. This doesn't make any sense. And this is actually in conjunction with what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, because I trust is moving their custodianship from Fortress to a designated bank. And I said in, in the video, I talked about this, I said, you know, d depending how, how you want to see this, how you take it, yeah, it's going to be more TradFi. I know people don't really like traditional finance, but I said it, it is a registered bank, FDIC insured, and they actually are going to be doing the custodianship for all those assets. So I said, I don't care where it comes from. I know banks, people don't like banks, but at least they are regulated. So I can see that. But it does concern me about this, this fortress, this fortress move to 40 and why they're actually charging $125. But then I got this notice. I reached out to the team. I go, hey, what's going on? Because this doesn't make any sense. Why are you guys doing this? I said, no, no, it's not us. It's Fortress. And to, to blow this up so everybody understands, I Trust Capital wants to make it clear that it, it does not support Fortress's decision to charge I Trust Capital clients any exit fees, which I thought was weird because you know, why would they do that? But whatever. And as usual, I Trust makes it right. We want to reiterate this proposed $125 service fee is unprecedented, not customary in the marketplace, and unreasonably based on the prior experience and knowledge of third-party vendors. And we oppose it. If Fortress Trust proceeds with charging iTrust Capital clients the 125 service fee, iTrust Capital reimburse, we will reimburse all client accounts immediately upon transition to our new qualified custodian, 40 Bank. End of story. So I was like, ah, that's pretty good. And then I was actually, just between us, I was talking to the guys over at iTrust and I go, hey, what's going on with this custodianship? I like the bank, it's great, you know, whatever. I'm not really a big fan of banks, but sure. And they told me some things that I can't tell you because it's under embargo, but just let me tell you that uh, as far as custodianship, big, bigger names will be announced. I can't tell you who they are, but everybody uses them. So if you're worried about custodianship, it's not the issue. I think it's just growing pains and moving around from one custodian that may be pretty good to one that is great. And that's all I can really tell you. And then lastly, as a reminder, I know people will ask me, well, what I trust and, I, and Roth IRAs, I want to custody my own crypto, Rob, because that's what we talked about. Not your keys, not your crypto. I got gotcha. you. The problem with the Roth IRA is that it's a commodity. Bitcoins are commodities. You can't do that with a Roth IRA in the United States. Different, different places call for different things. But there was a case, it was called the McNulty case. And apparently what they thought they could do is they could create their own LLC and custody their own gold. Well, the IRA, when they went to go actually take, take the revenue, take profits from this over time, it's 59 and a half years old, the IRS said, what'd you do that for? You can't do that. It has to be another individual institution that custodies it for you if you self-custody it's null and void. And we're going to pay, you guys are going to pay penalties for that, for doing that. So I know people will say, well, why do you do that? Because that's, that's the rules. That's the way it is. Uh, even on Swan Bitcoin, Corey Kleppenstein, who is the biggest Bitcoin maxi, and his company does the same thing. And they say, look, it's just how it goes as far as with Roth IRAs. So to finish this up, the pros and cons of stocks. Stocks are not as volatile. I think, although we did see MicroStrategy, there was a little bit of volatility, but for S&P 500, it's not near as volatile as say like Bitcoin, say like Ethereum, say it's like Solana, Tuncoin, Pepe or whatever else you're into. It's not near as, but you have to take a look at what's risk versus reward. I gotta tell you, after doing this presentation to you, I'm really thinking about getting into MicroStrategy as just another way to, to diversify, but that's for me to do, not for you to do. Next one is you can be a millionaire in 29 years. The question is, do you have the time for that? And what the heck is 1 million gonna buy you in 29 years? I gotta tell you, uh, 30 years ago, a million dollars could buy you a boatload of stuff. Actually, literally, it could, call, it could probably buy you a really nice boat or yacht. Now a million dollars is not a million dollars. Correct me in the comment section, that's just how I see it. Next one is that with equities, and stocks, there's regulatory clarity. You don't have to worry about Gary Gensler dumping all over you. And then the last one, as far as like a pro, is what's called buy, borrow, die. We've talked about this before. Essentially, this is what uh, all the big money does, Mike, Michael Silla being one of them. Uh, they buy certain assets. They have stocks. They borrow against the stocks. And they don't have to pay 
the capital gains on that loan and they die and it goes into a trust and off their kids if they have kids. So there is that, but the con of that, of course, is also there's margin calls. So if you're going to use you know, your stocks as like some kind of backup as collateral, if they uh, undervaluate, like some do, you can get a margin call and lose everything or lose a chunk of it, not everything. And then pros and cons of Bitcoin and crypto. I think it's a massive opportunity, just like we took a look. And that was Bitcoin. I didn't even want to want to go down the rabbit hole of say like the other altcoins, the blue chips and even even farther down. But their volatility is high and the risk is much more. Second one is you can be a millionaire in less time, but the, but the time horizon stays the same. It has to be long. If we think it's going to happen in a year, it can. And we hear those stories and on X and, and TikTok and everywhere else about somebody who, who did a meme coin. But I don't think that is the way to do it. And I think if it's easy come, it's going to be easy go. That's just me. Bitcoin has got regulatory clarity. That part is good. I mean, we did have an ETH, or excuse me, a Bitcoin ETF approved. We also had an Ethereum ETF approved. But does that mean that Ethereum is off the hook and it's labeled a commodity? I don't think so. I think even with the Ethereum staking, they still say that could be an investment contract. And with XRP, I mean, they're still kind of in limbo. And we talked about this a couple of days ago with the uh, court proceeding of if SEC is going to keep coming at them or reappeal. Who knows? And then lastly, just like we talked about buy, borrow, and die with stocks, there is the borrow option for Bitcoin and there's new companies coming out. But I can tell you right now, that is not going to be me. You guys can figure that out as far as like borrowing against your Bitcoin or your altcoins and then see how that works for loans. I went down that road. I'm not going down that again. You might, you may call it shell shocked, you may call it uh, PTSD, but I am not going to go against my Bitcoin and take loans out. I know what happens with that. Good luck. That's all we got. Anyhow, that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe, all that great stuff.